Hi, this is Steve Bookbinder, your sales coach. Today, it is my pleasure and privilege and honor to be talking to our first guest, Dave Moore, David J. Moore. And many know him, but for those who don't, amazing bio. And let me just go through who Dave is, and I, and I want to talk to him about his views on selling and customers and a whole bunch of things of interest to all of us. Dave is now the CEO of Brightpool a commercially driven industry effort to secure identities under the anticipated new laws governing consumer data protection. Prior to this role, he was chairman of Zaxxis and president of WPP Digital. In both roles, he developed strategies to accelerate Zaxxis's and WPP Digital's growth worldwide. Dave has over 40 years of experience in media and technology. He finds new ways of making technologies work for marketers from early ad networks to search engine marketing, behavioral targeting, and today's bright pool opportunity, consumer identity. Dave founded and led 24-7 Media's, now Zaxxis's, growth from startup to a leader in digital marketing and ad technology. He sold the company to WPP in 2007 for $649 million. Excellent job there. He is a seasoned executive with expertise in all facets of the digital advertising industries, a member of the IAB, the Interactive Advertising Bureau's Board of Directors and Executive Committee. Previously, the IAB's chairman from 2009 to 2011. Dave has been an active member since 2002. Additionally, he serves as chairman of the IAB's Tech Lab. He served on the boards of DASL and DTSI until recently, which were both joint ventures with, the, with Dentsu in Japan and Korea. Board of Directors of the Advertising Education Foundation, AEF, and on the Board of Directors for Throttle, a leading data technology company. Dave has co-founded Digital Media Training, a professional development company. Thank you for that. Expert Savers, a digital transformation company for uh, community banks and dime store media, a platform that delivers insights about brand perception, message recall, and Purchase Intent, which was sold to Knowledge Networks in 2009. Dave has completed over 50 triathlons and has run 18 New York City marathons. And I just want to add two things to that bio, as amazing as that is. Dave, you don't train for the marathons. I'd just like to explain that. So you're the only one who runs that many without any training specifically for it. And the other one is you left out just one, one that you and I did together. So I just thought you might want to just comment on uh, both of those things. How do you do all that without training? Well, you forgot to say what you and I did together. Oh, that yes. Was we uh, swam the English Channel. But, Steve, after that introduction, I'm, I'm tired. I'm going to have to <laughs> cut some of these things up. Not only that, 40 years in this business, it, it seems like yesterday when I started. But in any event, it's been a fascinating journey over these years, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to talk to you about it. That's great. That's great. And I know that you, I've worked at your company in, in, in full disclosure, so I've worked for you in a lot of ways, and I work with you in a bunch of ways. You are one of the few people that I know in senior executive world who are great salespeople on top of everything else. Not everybody is great at sales. I've also seen you in a, as a customer. So you've got some sales skills and some buying skills that, that I think uh, can give us some insight into your views on customers and how they change and how that requires you and I to change. But let's start off this way. Can you tell us just a little bit about what you're currently doing at Brightpool? Well, as you know, after I sold w, or WPP 24-7 Media in 2007, and by the way, I always like to round it up because I am a salesman at heart to $650 million there we as go. opposed to 649 I spent 12 years at the company. I found it very exciting. It was a huge ecosystem. i would never worked for an agency before, and it was just uh, fascinating to be, be there. Martin Sorrell was running it at the time, and there was nothing that appealed to me that would entice me to leave the company to do something else until Brightpool came along. And when I saw it, it was really exciting because it the mission was to create the dominant connection for identity verification for the 41 billion online advertising marketplace 
which is essentially the marketplace outside of Google and Facebook. So Brightpool is a next generation identity company. It deals with the fact that third party cookies are not a very effective way to target consumers anymore and are slowly being diminished in terms of their use in the industry. Advertisers are now looking for the use of identities in a manner that they haven't been used before. And what's very exciting about this is that it has to be a, a, a industry effort that mm. requires inclusion and cooperation between all the participants in the digital advertising marketplace. So that's advertisers, publishers, consumers, ad tech companies. And it requires me to use every contact that I've ever made in this industry, as well as every skill that I've ever developed in the digital marketplace in order to make this big idea a reality. So it's a very exciting time for uh, me and for Brightpool. And it must say, I'm um, very energized and, and we are doing very well so far. And I'm very optimistic about our, our chances for success which of course, as you know, are never guaranteed in a startup. No, they're not. And uh, certainly a salesperson needs a lot of optimism, but it's a very interesting, you know, the, if you boil that down, you know, from our point of view, it's how do you usher in the next anything? How do you become a pioneer to anything? And it sounds like selling skills essential to your uh, success currently. I, I wonder if we can go back a couple of steps. I'm wondering you know, how did you get into sales in the first place? What even occurred to you in your early life that made you think to go in that direction? Well, you know, when I was growing up, my parents actually thought that I should become a, a lawyer because my arguments in terms of staying out later or getting off a particular punishment or whatever were very, very compelling. Nice. Now, <laughs> You know, I do like to read, but not as much as is required to become a lawyer and to be one. And so sales was a natural outlet for me because when you think about a sale, you do create steps toward consummating that sale that are arguably similar to what a lawyer does to win a case. And so I found that sales was a sweet spot for me. One of the things I did early on in sales was become a student of sales, a student of sales techniques that have been proven over the years. Basic, basic blocking and tackling, which I still brush up on today. And the fact of the matter is, is that whatever position you're in, you do have to sell at times. Now, some do it better than others, but the one product you always have to be able to sell is yourself. So everybody can benefit from sales training because if you can't sell yourself, nobody else can. Mm. Well, that's, uh, you know, I, I think that's so right. I see that sometimes there's a reliance on the, just the features or just the obvious benefits to a product where, you know, the, the company or the sales department or the salesperson is hoping just, just showing the product, just presenting it, that's good enough. And I think they often leave out that, that human element that you need. So what were some of the things you did early on above and beyond just having a job in sales? You know, most people only learn from on the job training. So what other kind of things did you do to, to give you more, a, a better edge than just that? I started reading books. You know, in those days, you could go into a Barnes & Noble, and of course, today it's on Amazon, and you can find any number of books on sales. And what started me into that learning process, if you will, was when I got into the television business. I was 25 years old, and the fellow running the company was a big believer in sales training and did some you know, on a quarterly basis within the company. So I started picking up books that I felt related to the type of sale that I was making in the television business. It's rarely a case where you just sell a person one time. Many of your clients you're doing business with over and over again over the course of the year. So in terms of a, a sales book, 
was more about relational relationship selling as opposed to, let's say, selling a house or a car where many times that sale is one time and you never see the person again. So I started listening to, in those days, audio tapes of some of the books. And I also found that a big part of sales is enthusiasm. In fact, I can argue 51% of the sale is enthusiasm. Mm. And fortunately for me, I have uh, the God gift of waking up in the morning being positive. I, I am a positive individual. Even when I'm not feeling all that positive, people think I am. And, and so one of the things I also did was listen to motivational types of tapes read motivational books. I mean, The Power of Positive Thinking was one of the first ones that I I read, and I can still remember some of the phrases that Norman Vincent Peale suggested you you recite to yourself on a a regular basis. So I am very fortunate in that I have continued to excel in, in positive mental attitude, very enthusiastic overall, and I continue to be a student of sales. You know, you know, one very interesting takeaway from that is you're saying that you're already naturally good at waking up in the morning and being positive. And so let's call that your biggest strength or one of your biggest strengths. And mm-hmm. here you're saying, even though that's already your biggest strength and you know it, that's where you're focusing even more time developing, getting better at the thing you're already good at. That, you know, that is, that's, you know, when you hear it, that it's obvious, but I think there's so many people that conclude once they think they know something, I, I don't need any training. I think I'm good. Yeah. Well, as you know, Steve, practice is important. Am I still learning some new things? Absolutely. But what else am I doing? I'm practicing. It's like the shortstop in a major league baseball game in between innings when they go out into the field. They're taking ground balls as shortstop, throwing them to the first base or third base. You, you know, do they need to understand how to throw baseball and how to get a runner out? No, but they're continuing to practice picking that ball up in their glove and throwing it to first base. Or a golfer who's professional golfer is spending 10 hours a day practicing. Same thing with a musician. You know, Liberace was a great example of that. People said, you're a genius. He says, yeah, but I practice 15 hours a day. So when you think about it, practicing sales skills is a critical component of being on top of your game. Yeah. Practice. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I've, I've started to think that every day is a workshop in a sense that every day you're practicing something. The problem is that people don't do a lot of training every day or practicing whatever they usually do. So they just get better and better, better at that. So let me ask you this. If somebody, you know, you read a lot in today about AI and, you know, machines are going to replace people and, you know, the whole economy is going to change. What would you say to someone considering a career in sales today? Well, it's, it's not for everybody. That's for sure. And one of the things that I have found that separates the great salespeople from the average ones are the abilities to get through peaks and valleys of the sales process. You know, you hear all the time that people quit, certain percentage of people quit after hearing one no, another percentage quit after two no. Another you know, percentage after three, and just about everybody is gone after five. Mm-hmm. Everybody's gone. But the folks that continue to persist, that get the six and seven, knows don't always get the ball over the goal line, but many times are successful because they're the only ones left competing for that piece of business. And, and so when you're selling, there's days where you wonder what, where your skills have gone. Nobody wants to do business with you. Nobody wants to talk to you. You might go a week without a sale. And depending on the type of, of business in which you're selling, you could go a month without a sale. And mm-hmm. that can be very demoralizing for people. Mm-hmm. 
But the ones that are the best, if they realize that more activity is going to lead to better results, and one more no means I'm closer to the yes, and being able to motivate themselves and recognize that they have to continue to persevere, they got to get more active, they got to develop that pipeline, and those are the ones that I find to be more most successful because they're able to continue to persevere during that valley, which certainly occurs when you're in the game of selling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I, I would use the, the term work habits. You know, I've observed you for many years, excellent work habits. The most incredible thing to me when I watch you is that you're able to do a number of different things. You know, you hold all these simultaneous positions and board positions and other kinds of initiatives all at the same time, just, just the busyness of it. And you always seem to be in a, you know, also have a joke with you. So it's amazing, <laughs> what, you know? And so, you know, so I look at, I think that sales is part who you are. I think people go, you know, I'm a born salesperson. And that's probably part of it. But I think it's also a lot about what you do. You know, it's just, you know, it's, and I'm saying it because I think that there are people that go into sales as a career, but let's just talk for a second about that entrepreneur or the business owner, the person who, doesn't really think of themselves as a salesperson, but now has to sell their company or their product or their services. They got to get the sell the distributors on carrying them. So you know, it's not they, they don't they're not natural salespeople, but now they have to sell. You know, so they're not going to get there only on personality, maybe. But what are the work habits that salespeople should be adopting, or anybody that has to produce sales? Well, the first item, which is a limited resource that a salesperson has is time. How are you spending your time? And as you know, Steve, the more time you spend selling, the more business you close. It is a simple fact. So how do you do that? How do you spend more time selling? And, you know, I, I, I love talking to new salespeople. They just get a job. They go to work at a, a new company. And I, I say to them, you know, what, what are you going to do your first week there? Your first month? How, how are you thinking about it? And you get some people that say, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to learn the product to you know, get to know everybody in a company and I just understand how to pitch it and so on and so forth. I said, you know what? That's not the first thing you should do. Well, what should it be? First thing you need to do is start go getting appointments. Do you think you're going to get an appointment tomorrow if you make a call today? Probably not. Maybe you will. But get appointments. You're the new guy in town. You want to talk to people. And you know what you do when you make those appointments? You bring your sales manager along so that they can help you understand how to sell the product. And by the way, when you call on a new person and say you're new in town, just want to come over and get to know, the most important thing you can do is create relationships in sales. So those that say I need all the tools and I got to get everything organized before I can go out and start talking are not going about it the right way because the most important thing you can start doing is, is building your pipeline. And how do you do that? You start with making appointments. And you focus your time on the activities that relate specifically to selling that give you the ability to spend more time selling than anything else. And moving forward, if you operate that way and utilize your time as a precious commodity and realize every time you're not using your time to sell, you are not moving the ball forward as quickly as you might if you were. And that is, to me, the most important aspect of a salesperson's life is how they manage their time. Mm -hmm. I've heard you describe that in these words, organized around the task. And you'll, you'll point out somebody that is or is not organized around the task. Just wondering if you could just expand on, on your thinking with that phrase. Well, there, there's a book written by famous management consultant, Peter Drucker. And if any of you have read any of his books, most of them are like five, 600 pages long, very difficult to get through. But he, the book that he wrote on the effective executive, it's a short book. And in fact, you don't even have to read it because I can tell you what it says. 
what the most important right. message is. Yeah, right. And that is that the effective executives organizes his activities around those items that make him or her most effective. Sounds simple, doesn't it? And so if you put that into the salesperson's, you know, life, what's, what are the things that are going to make you effective? Time spent selling, pipeline development, organize your business priorities around those tasks that are going to make you most effective. Sounds simple, but hard to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's probably because it's easier to do some other tasks. Sometimes it feels like salespeople want to avoid selling. I got to get ready. I always like the getting ready. I never quite got, what are you doing when you're getting ready? How about, how about like make the appointment and get ready while you're driving? You can multitask, get ready and get on the train to get there. Well, um, well you know, people gravitate to the tasks that they like to do. I mean, that's, that's natural. But the tasks that they like to do don't necessarily make them an effective executive. Right, right. On, on the subject of things I've heard you say, and you and I have talked about this in the past, but I'd, I'd love for you to uh, give your thoughts on sales etiquette. And, and I especially in comparison to, the, I think there was a sales etiquette or an expected protocol of salespeople. And maybe that's changed, and maybe our audience, the uh, customer's expectations have changed. But what, what do you think are, is the appropriate sales etiquette in, the, in today's market? That's a good question, because in this era of a lot of yelling and screaming about the country and what have you, <laughs> the first thing I'd say is stay away from politics. But seriously, politeness is very important overall. How you are dressed is important. You know, how you talk to a prospect or a client in terms of looking them in the eyes and 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 listening, as, as I said, God gave you a mouth and two ears, and you're supposed to use them in those proportions. But what I find with a lot of folks, I'll get an email from somebody that's trying to sell me something, and it's like, hey, Dave, and they're abbreviating words and things like that. Now, when I send a, an email nowadays, even to my family, it's, it's I make sure the spelling is correct, it's grammatically right, and 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 so overall, as they say, you only get one chance to make a good first impression. And so when it comes to etiquette, it's about how you talk, how you look, how you, you know, if, if and, and, you know, I'm 67 years old right now. And if somebody's older than me, I still call them Mr. Jones. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I, I find I get young salespeople, like I say, hey, Dave, you know, I, mm-hmm. I'd rather be in the position of saying, hey, look, don't call me Mr. Moore, call me Dave. But I always look to respect who I'm calling on. And if they're older than me, I address them as such. But a lot of these items are fall into the category of common sense is not so common. And I would just encourage everybody to Always put your best foot forward. Think about how the prospect is going to perceive you. What can you do to bond with that individual in a way that allows that relationship to, to prosper and flourish? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I agree. I, I tell salespeople that they become, in the mind of the customer, the product. So, you know, if you work for a research company, then I want the salesperson to be like the product itself. I want them to be curious and a researcher, a person who actually does research and is a fan of research and actually knows stuff that only somebody who's a fan would even know. And, you know, it should be, it shouldn't just be a veneer on the top. It's got to be like in their DNA. And Mm. I think that's, I'm hearing you say that sales etiquette is like personal branding. This is my brand when I, when I follow sales etiquette. Yes, absolutely correct. Yeah. And I've heard you, you know, the other thing, I've t- you'll use the term excellent, but not simply as a, a throwaway line, but truly as a score when something is truly excellent. So I think that, I, you know, in seeing you work and, and working at your company and seeing how myself and others react to you, I think when you 
when you are striving for excellence, then the expectation of anybody you're talking to is good, good is not good enough. Only excellence is good enough. And so I think you, you start to approach, like, how do you organize yourself not to check the box? How do you, check, how do you organize yourself for excellence? What would sales etiquette be ex, if, you know, if you're trying to communicate that excellent brand? Well, you know, it's that old saying that if you throw your, your spirit an eagle and you miss, it hits the ground, whereas you throw your spirit the sun, you might hit an eagle on the way down. So yeah. I think part of it is if you just plan to be good, and that's going to be the best you're going to be. And if you plan to be excellent, you're not always going to achieve that, but at least you've set the bar high. And, you know, I, I just find also in working with people that we don't spend enough time giving them feedback on the job. And my feedback will go from good to great <laughs> to <laughs> excellent. But, you know, there was a book written, gosh, it's at least 20 years ago now called The One Minute Manager. And what's interesting is half the companies in the book have changed quite a bit since it was written. But the whole premise of the book was walking around and look for something that the employees are doing well, as opposed to what they're not doing so well. And as you know, business tends to be pointing out to people what they've done wrong most of the time. And there's not enough of what I would call positive reinforcement that, you know, increases uh, a person's desire to succeed. Yeah. It's an interesting point. You know, you're talking about the relationship between the coach, the manager, and the salesperson. And the manager has more than one role. They're not just a coach. They have these uh, other roles as well. But I've always believed that if you have a coach, you're going to do better just having a coach. I mean, it, it works that way in sports, but it works that way when you have a coach that wants to coach people. So what are some of the things that you see that coaches, managers are, are doing well? And what do you see that coaches, managers maybe not doing so well? With it? Well, as you pointed out, sales manager's job, among other things, is to be a coach. And the biggest failing that I see with many sales managers, is they're not very good coaches. They go on a sales call with the, the salesperson as opposed to sitting back, taking notes on, on how the salesperson's delivering the pitch, how the client is responding to them. They're, they you know, essentially push the salesperson aside and start selling the product themselves. Mm -hmm. And certainly the salesperson there is going to hear from the sales manager in terms of how they like to sell. And, and after that happens a few times, I'm sure a salesperson could completely mimic what the sales manager's approach is, but they're not helping. They're not coaching the salesperson. Mm. And, you know, one of the, one of the things I, I kid about all the time is that people are reluctant to hire somebody smarter than themselves. Mm -hmm. And as, as I kid around, I, I say it's always been easy for me to hire people smarter than myself. But the reason why is that if you don't hire excellent people, if you don't coach your salespeople properly, who's going to take your job? And some people worry, oh, well, if I coach them well, you know, they're going to take my job. But that's how you get promoted. Mm-hmm. People mm. don't want to promote you if they don't think there's anybody that can step in and start doing what you're doing. They worry about they're going to lose revenue and they're going to lose X, Y, or Z. That's an and excellent so, point. Excellent point. You know, the important, important, very important to coach people, make these employees as good as they can possibly be so they can replace you so that you can move on and assume more responsibility and further your career. It's, you know, Another great saying, surround yourself with intelligent people that contribute directly to your success. That's the key to being a successful sales manager or executive in today's day and age. And that has been the fact since the beginning of time. Mm, wow. Very interesting. Well, well, uh, along those lines, you know, bringing somebody with you into a sales meeting we now are in a world where everybody's selling a solution. You used to sell a thing, now you're selling a solution. It used to be a system, then it became a solution. But the solution sale became a bigger, I don't know which came first, like a chicken and egg. 
the salesperson wanting to sell a solution or the buyer needing something that requires a solution. But it feels like you need a team of people on the sales side and a team of people on the customer side to consummate the sale. You know, do, do you see it like that? Do you think, and do you think that's, that's changing the kind of skills that salespeople need or the range of skills that salespeople now need? Sales strategy continues to evolve. And if you think about how solution selling began, and it's been around a while now, it's because every buyer has some sort of problem in terms of, of what they need in order to be successful. And so the whole premise on solution selling is to discover what that problem is and, and how your product or products can, and can solve that particular issue. Makes a lot of sense. I think the, the biggest problem nowadays for salespeople overall is is being able to get audiences with with the buyers in person. Now you can certainly research a lot about what their problems might be, but there is just no substitute for being able to sit down in your prospect's office or any other setting on a one-to-one -one basis to really understand what makes that individual tick. You know, it may be that there really aren't any problems with with their their needs, so to speak, but maybe it's they have a personal need to do something innovative that you can provide. Maybe it's something personal for that particular person that you're calling on that allows you to solve that for that individual, whatever that personal item is that creates a bond that the next time there's an opportunity to sell something, you're the first person that they call. Mm -hmm. So the biggest problem, again, is, is getting time and attention in this, what I would call tension deficit disorder society of emails and voicemails. I mean, there are people that are not even reading emails that are deleting them. There are people that are not even listening to voicemails because they just have too many, they delete them. There are people that don't wanna see anybody that they don't know because they already know 300 people that are selling them a certain product or service. So the question ultimately becomes, how do you break through that clutter? Mm -hmm. how, do you, how, do you, how do you create that, that urgency to get that person to see you. And it's not easy. It's harder than it's ever been before. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I like the, the perspective that you're giving. It's not just that it's hard in, for all the reasons that you said, but it's, it's specifically a game where the customer is looking at the comparison. You know, I, I've already, I, you know, I already have that solution solved, so I don't need to talk to somebody else. So I, you know, you don't just see the salesperson, you see them in the context. I've already got it covered. I already know somebody like you're one of 30 people. I also think that if you just have the same kind of an email as the other guy, it looks like your product is like the other guy. They're, they're sending the same kind of messaging with that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we first got together to form this company, the, the, you were at that time the chair of the IAB. And, and we came at it with a, with a thought of how do we get the best in the brightest? Now, this is 2009. How do we get the best and the brightest into the digital world? That's where the uh, greatest jobs are. That's where the uh, opportunities of the future are. And that was 2009, but in digital years, like dog years, that was like a, 100 years ago. Because that was 2019, almost 2020. What do you see as, if you're a salesperson, where do you see the... The, the job or the career opportunities in sales and related jobs are going forward? Good question. As, as we spoke earlier, the, to be a great salesperson nowadays, I can argue, is, is a lot more difficult than it used to be. And you talked about earlier artificial intelligence. Is it going to replace our salespeople? It's not going to replace them. However, what it does allow you to do when you use technology such as that or what other tech platforms that, that can help you accomplish tasks quicker than you used to do in the past, it allows you to handle a lot more business. 
because some of the time they used to have to spend to prepare for a call, do research, et cetera, et cetera, was, you know, necessary, took away from your time spent selling, but without being armed with important information about that particular client, you were less likely to succeed. Nowadays, that preparation time has, has been dimin diminished significantly with platforms like salesforce.com and, and others. All the information that you gather and put into that just makes your dossier on clients all that much more effective. So in today's day and age, where information on clients is readily available and, and your ability to categorize clients and gather information on them that remains in a place that you'll always have access to is one of the ways that a salesperson can develop a competitive advantage. Now, there are certain industries like Walmart as an example. They give you a piece of software and they say, hey, look, you install that software on your computer. And by the way, you don't have to come and visit us. We're not allowed to even have you buy us a cup of coffee. But when we need some widgets, which is what you guys make, we're going to send you a request for a proposal. And we're also going to send it to the rest of your competitors and may the best man win. And so Walmart right now has essentially tried to eliminate the personal aspect of sales. Now, are there places where it could still come into play with Walmart? Sure, you win the business and there's a problem or whatever and you handle it right away. There's other ways for you to create relationships. But for the most part, Walmart has determined that, hey, if you have a personal relationship with me, I might be apt to buy your product even if it's more expensive. They don't want that to happen anymore, hence their whole strategy of nobody's allowed to go out to lunch with a supplier, and we have a software program, and that's how we want to do business. Now, is that going to spread into more and more industries? It depends on the industry and depends on the products, but it's certainly something to keep a careful watch on. Mm. Well, it probably will in an industry where the salesperson is not adding any extra value other than getting the request for proposal, getting it to the team that writes the proposal, and then bringing it back. If that's all they're doing, I mean, not literally doing that, but, you know, if that's it. But uh, do you think it's a mistake? I mean, I've been reading about procurement and, you know, the advances in that, but we deal with procurement. Some service, if you're brought, buying, like, boxes of nails, I guess it makes sense to to buy it without human intervention. And maybe you could say that about programmatic ad inventory you could do without human intervention. But what about, do you think it's a mistake? I mean, are customers actually not losing the opportunity to potentially get a better deal than they would have if they didn't use this RFP, uh, don't talk to human system of buying? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because it goes both ways. I mean, for instance, right now you have the advent of direct-to-consumer brands, whether it's a, a mattress or it's a car service or it's other types of clothing or, or products. And what the direct-to-consumer brands are demonstrating, take Dollar Shave Club as an example. It's a subscription product. You get your razors de delivered in every, every month. And they have a relationship with you, the subscriber. They're mm -hmm. sending you notes. They have an idea of what you consume and so on and so forth. Compare that to Gillette, right? Who mm. has their relationship been with? Well, basically, it's been the retailer. Mm. Putting that out on the, the, the retailer's store shelves. And when the consumer comes in because they've advertised Gillette so much, they see Gillette, oh, that's a good brand, I'll buy it. But do they have an individual relationship with the consumer like Dollar Shave Club does? No. And everybody now watching direct to the consumer brands and our, you know, big contact lenses, you name it, they, they are focusing on one part uh, or one product, if you will, and making it easy to buy. Those companies are actually getting into the one-to-one -one relationships as opposed to going the other way, which is one of the things you just suggested. Are they, are they losing that ability? Well, direct to consumers trying to gain it because for the most part, they, they really didn't have it in mass merchandising in the past. Now, 
you know, as a salesperson, you, you have to think about how you can organize information that's important to your clients that gives you that opportunity to have a conversation. And listen, it's, it's not easy. It takes a lot of creative thinking many times. And of course, if you are selling a box of nails, it has become somewhat of a commodity. It's hard to make that into something more than that. But look at what's happened in terms of used cars. Mm -hmm. You can go online and find them. You can go online and find real estate. And it's airline tickets, Mm -hmm. uh, hotels. You know, there has been a group of middlemen, call it, or middle women, not always in sales, but, you know, look at travel agency business. How Mm -hmm. tough has that been? Thomas Cook. Been right. around 180 years, right? Out of yeah. business, bankrupt. So you do have this intermediation taking place. But look, you know that's happening. If if it's an industry that that where it's ripe for, well, you know, the, the job there is going to be different than being a day-to-day salesperson. You just have to prepare for it. Or look for industries where this intermediation is, is not occurring, where you think you got a longer window where you can be a straight day-to-day salesperson. But frankly, is that going to be a role for the foreseeable future? I suggest it's going to, day-to-day sales is going to be important, but there's going to be a lot of other responsibilities that are part of it. Yeah. Well, you know, I see a complete merging of marketing and sales. I mean, just listen to the kind of things you said. If you're going to use Salesforce and marketing platforms like HubSpot to just try to communicate with more people than you ever communicated at the same time all at once, so, you know, instead of communicating with 10 people, you communicate with 1,000, that's marketing, you know, and and, and you got to think like a marketer. So now you got to, you used to just have to be, you know, in the old days, I don't know what the old days are, but, you know, at one point you could have a smile and you got a personality. Now you have to know how to write emails. And you have to know uh, how do you you know send maybe a video message to somebody, or or how do you do social stuff if you can connect with them a year before they're ready to buy your product, but you can at least start reaching them in some way on a, a LinkedIn or something like that. It feels like you need to think like a marketer now, and that's become a sales mm-hmm. skill. Definitely. You you probably meet with a lot of salespeople. I mean, I know you do in the media industry, and that would be people that sell ad inventory, but that might also be people that are on the ad tech side. Any advice for people in the salespeople in the media business? You have to learn technology nowadays. Everything's going digital. You still have some traditional sales in the television business that are not digitally driven, although over the top television is coming on really fast right now and it's most likely going to be the predominant way people receive television in the future. Selling media digitally is a lot different than selling it in the traditional sense. So what's important is is having a good understanding of the technology and how it works becomes a key in being a successful salesperson in media. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's so true. And I know just one, one not so talked about part of why that's so true is if you don't have that mastery of that vocabulary, then you're at the risk of walking into a meeting. The other guy, the other person uses a word you don't know. And now you feel stupid. You're trying to be Mm -hmm. on top of your game and now you're feeling stupid. Hard to ask the right questions Mm -hmm. and, and, and advance the sale. Well, Dave, this has been a great. I really appreciate your time. I'm going to give you a, one, one more question that I'd like to end with, and it's about advice to people, and, and we could extend this beyond sales. You know, you're, you, you've run these marathons, and you've told me that you, you, know, you get tired at the end, and it hurts. What, you, you eventually sold the WPP, but I, I know that at, at some earlier points, the, the company went through some rough spots, and of course, it eventually comes out successful on the other end. But what advice do you have for people that are struggling and they really need to be relentless and they need to keep going? What, what, what's a motivational message that we could leave them with? Never give up. One of my favorite people in the world was Winston Churchill. He had a lot of great quotes. And one of them was, never give up. And if you remember, he took over at a very tough time 
in the UK when he became prime minister in the middle of World War II. And he did not give up. And there are many times when I've said that to myself, never give up. Now, you know, certainly there are some times where there's nothing more that can be done. But in those bad times, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, as they say, and persevering through those valleys that we talked about earlier, having that attitude that I'm going to make this happen. I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up after that third no. I'm not giving up after that fifth no. I'm going to stay after that until I succeed is probably the most important thing anybody can do. Wow. What a great way to end this interview. Dave, thank you so much for sharing your secrets, your thoughts, your ideas with us. There's so much to, to take away from that. Thank you so much. And just for everybody, remember, I'm Steve Bookbinder. I'm your sales coach. Thanks for sharing your break with us today. Check out our training specials for individuals and teams on our website, dmtraining.net. Also, please contact me, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, send me an email, or send an email to steve at dmtraining.net if I can help you and your team make more sales easier. Thank you.